Good evening aspirants, welcome to daily editorial analysis of Shankar IAS Academy. Today's date is 23rd October 2024. Displayed here are the list of topics that we are going to discuss today. Now let us get into the discussion. Now look at this article, India faces a severe shortage of quality jobs which threatens the social stability. The growing inequality which is fueled by the technological advancement and the allied power concentration undermines the dignity and financial security of the country. The political responses have been inadequate according to this article. So, there is a need for structural reforms to ensure the inclusive economic participation. So, in this context, let us discuss the current status of unemployment in India. See, the unemployment rate was around 8.1% in April 2024 and it went up to 7.4% in March 2024. However, the periodic labor force survey data for 2023 records the unemployment rate is 3.1 percentage. So, this is a sharp contrast due to differences in survey methods. The 8.1 percentage unemployment rate in 2024 is calculated by the Center for Monitoring Indian Economy that is CMIE and this 3.1 percentage for 2023 is recorded by periodic labor force survey. So, there is a difference in calculating the unemployment rates. Unemployment rate remains higher in urban areas which is 5.2 percentage compared to rural areas where the unemployment rate is just 2.4 percentage. The youth population particularly those with secondary or higher education faces significant challenges. They account for 83 percentage of unemployed workforce in the country. Now let us see some government initiatives to address the unemployment. The first one is Atmanirbar Bharat Rojgar Yojana. It was launched to incentivize the employers in order to create the jobs and the scheme has been extended to increase the formal employment. Under this scheme, the formal employment is improved by subsidizing the employment provident fund contributions. Then the second one is National Apprenticeship Promotion Scheme that is NAPS. This scheme aims to bridge the skill gap by providing financial support to employers for hiring the apprentices. Then Pradhan Mantri Kaushal Vikas Yojana. It focuses on skill development and upskilling workers to enhance the employability. The last one is Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme. This scheme provides 100 days of age employment in rural areas, creating a safety net for unemployed people in rural areas. So, these are some of the important government initiatives to address the unemployment. Now, what are the challenges in addressing the unemployment? The first important challenge is skill mismatch. See, a large portion of workforce lacks skills which are required for the available jobs. Only 4.7% of India's workforce has formal skill training. The next important reason is informal sector dominance. See, roughly about 90% of workers are engaged in informal employment which lacks stability and benefits. The next one is youth unemployment. Despite we have a demographic dividend, the larger youth force faces underemployment. So, they have limited opportunities outside agriculture. So, there is a prevalence of large youth unemployment and they contribute for more than 80 percentage of unemployed workforce in the country. The female labor force participation is improving but it also remains below the global averages. So, it is only 41 percentage which is below the global average. Now, let us see some way forward points for addressing the unemployment. First one is fostering skill development. See, expanding the formal skill training programs and focusing on emerging sectors like digital services can help address the unemployment and skill gap. Next about boosting the formal employment. See, majority of forces is concentrated in informal employment. So, encouraging the growth of formal sectors along with the policies which support the micro and small industries can create more stable jobs. So, the formal employment also provides a social security benefits. So, this is not available in informal employment. The next one is inclusive policies for women, enhancing programs which are aimed at increasing the women participation in labor force, especially in urban areas can increase the participation of women in workforce. So, thereby it improves the employment rate. The last one is non-form employment. See, accelerating the growth of non-farm sectors, particularly in rural areas, is crucial for reducing the reliance on agriculture. See, agriculture contribute very less to the GDP of the country, but most of the workforce in rural areas are concentrated in agricultural sector. So, this has to be addressed and more formal employment should be brought in rural areas. So, these are the important way forward points for addressing the unemployment in India. With this, let us conclude the discussion. Now, look at this article. It discuss the global threat of antimicrobial resistance. United Nations General Assembly has recognized this antimicrobial resistance as a major health and economic challenge globally. It emphasizes the need for solutions that integrate 
human, animal and environmental health. World Bank estimates the antimicrobial resistance could lead to healthcare cost of up to $1 trillion by 20. So, this also leads to significant GDP losses for many countries. In this context, let us discuss about the antimicrobial resistance. The antimicrobial resistance, which is called as AMR, occurs when a microorganism such as bacteria, virus, fungi and parasites evolve and become resistant to the drugs. So, the drugs that which we are already using to treat these infections, to treat these kinds of microbes, they become resistant to these drugs. So, this is called antimicrobial resistance. This includes the resistance to antibiotics, antivirals, antifungals and antiparasitics. So, the microbes like bacteria, virus, fungi and parasite become resistant to these drugs and this condition is called as antimicrobial resistance. Now, what are the major causes for this AMR? Let us look at them one by one. The first major cause is overuse of antibiotics. The excessive and inappropriate prescribing of antibiotics in both humans and animals can promote the development of resistant strains in these microbes. So, over a period of time, these microbes develop resistance for these antibiotics. So, they become antibiotic resistance. The next one is incomplete treatment course. See, the patients who do not complete their prescribed antibiotic courses may leave some bacteria alive, which means these bacteria mutate and develop resistance for these drugs. The third one is use of antibiotics in agriculture. See, antibiotics are used for livestock for their growth promotion and disease prevention. And this can lead to the development of resistant bacteria in livestock. And these bacteria can be transmitted to humans through consuming the livestock food. So, this is how the use of antibiotics in agriculture can affect the humans. The next one is poor infection prevention and control. See, inadequate hygiene and sanitation practices in healthcare can increase the spread of these resistance organisms. So, the poor prevention and control of these bacteria or microbes can lead to increased antimicrobial resistance. Now, let us see the socio-economic impact of antimicrobial resistance. Obviously, the first major impact is the increased health care cost. So, there are longer hospital stays, expensive treatments and advanced diagnostics can lead to increased health care cost and this leads to the loss of GDP for developing countries. So, this is a huge health burden for countries like India. The next major impact is loss of productivity. See, the prolonged illness caused by antimicrobial resistant diseases can affect the individuals and can also affect the collective productivity of the economy. Next one is the impact on trade and travel. Some countries may limit the imports from regions with high antibiotic misuse. So, this can affect the global trade. The next one is increased poverty and inequality. See, the poorer countries face higher risk for antimicrobial resistance. Thereby, it pushes more poor households into extreme poverty. This can also impact the agriculture and livestock. See, antibiotic overuse in animals reduces the production and causes economic losses. So, repeated infections in animals can threaten the food safety and supply of these livestock products. So far, we have seen the socio-economic impacts of antimicrobial resistance. Now, let us see what are the initiatives taken to fight this AMR. The first one is Global Action Plan on Antimicrobial Resistance. See, World Health Organization plan guides countries in developing AMR strategies to raise awareness. It also aims to reduce the infection rates and promote responsible antibiotic use and research. The antimicrobial stewardship programs. See, hospitals implement this ASP to ensure antibiotics are prescribed only when they are necessary. They have to educate the healthcare workers and patients on proper usage of antibiotics. So, misuse of antibiotics or overuse of antibiotics can lead to antimicrobial resistance. The third one is regulating the antibiotic use in agriculture. So, regulating the antibiotic use in humans and hospitals is not enough. We have to regulate the antibiotic use in agricultural field also. The countries such as European Union nations restrict the antibiotics in livestock to limit their misuse. There should be public awareness campaigns to make more awareness of antibiotic resistance among the illiterate and rural peoples. Campaigns like World Antimicrobial Awareness Week that is from November 18 to 24 was conducted by World Health Organization and this year theme was Educate, Advocate, Act Now. So, this is a theme for World Antibiotic Awareness Week, which is from November 18 to November 24. So far, we have seen the initiatives to fight antimicrobial resistance in global level. Now, let us see what are the initiatives taken in India to fight the AMR. The National Plan on AMR, which was created in 2017, 
This plan tackles AMR by raising awareness, improving infection control and optimizing the antimicrobial use. It also enhances surveillance and promotes research against antimicrobial resistance. Then AMR Surveillance Network which is created by Indian Council of Medical Research. This network monitors the AMR across hospitals and tracks the resistant pathogens. So they develop the national treatment guidelines for AMR. The next one is national program on the containment of AMR. It focuses on infection control, racial antibiotic use and regulating the over-the-counter sales of antibiotics. So these are the important initiatives taken in India to control the AMR. With this, let us conclude the discussion. This is the main question regarding this topic. Discuss the socio-economic impact of antimicrobial resistance in the context of increasing cases of tuberculosis in India. With this, let us conclude the discussion and move to the next news article. Now look at this article. It emphasizes the need for UN peacekeeping force to do a proactive role in preventing the conflicts. See, the UN peacekeeping forces are also referred to as the blue helmets. And they have to actively protect the civilians and prevent the atrocities instead of playing a bystander role. They shouldn't simply watch the conflict, they should actively involve in preventing the conflict and protecting the civilians. So this is what this article is talking about. The author of the article is criticizing the UN failure in conflicts like Ukraine and Gaza where the peacekeepers lacked enforceable mandates. So this calls for urgent reforms in UN Security Council for better peacekeeping operations. So in this context, let us discuss about the UN peacekeeping. UN peacekeeping forces are deployed to help the countries transition from conflict to peace and they have three core principles. The first one is consent of parties involved. The second one is impartiality in actions and the third one is non-use of force except in self-defense or mandated protection. So this non-use of force provision is itself a drawback because they have to actively protect the civilians in the times of conflict. Now let us see the scope for UN peacekeeping forces. They support for ceasefire agreements, they monitor peacekeeping process and they are also involved in disarmament and reintegration. They are involved in conducting elections and human rights protection in the areas which are affected by conflicts. They also actively involved in the conflict zones across continents like Africa, Asia and Middle East. So this is the relevance of UN peacekeeping force in the present day world. Now, what are the challenges for UN peacekeeping forces? The first one is resource limitation. See, there is an inadequate funding and personnel for UN peacekeeping forces. So, they cannot carry out the protection activities for civilians in conflict zones. The second one is vague mandates. Often, there are unclear objectives and limited authority to act on the issues. So, they do not know what to do and they play a bystander role instead of actively protecting the civilians. The third one is geopolitical influence. See the political interest of major powers like for example take the security council members, the permanent members, the P5 member countries can affect the activities of the UN peacekeeping force. The next one is operational risk. It is difficult to maintain neutrality in dangerous conflict zones. So the ground level issues like the operational risk are also a factor in affecting the efficiency of peacekeeping force. So the first one is resource limitation, the next one is vague mandate, the third one is geopolitical influences from superpowers and the fourth one is operational risk. So these are the major challenges for UN peacekeeping forces in protecting the civilians and preventing the conflict. Now what is the role of UN Security Council in authorizing and implementing the peacekeeping missions? See generally the UN Security Council authorizes the peacekeeping missions through resolutions. The resolution of UN Security Council defines three things. What is their mandate and what are their resources and their renewal. The mandate means the goals and scope of the mission that they are going to involve in. For example, if there is a Russia-Ukraine conflict or Lebanon-Israel conflict, they are going to stop the conflict or they are going to protect the civilians. So, what is the goal and scope of the mission? That is the mandate. Then resources. Resources means allocating the budget and personnel. Majorly, the resources and budget are allocated by the superpowers that is the P5 countries. So, mostly the peacekeeping missions are biased towards the interest of the superpowers since they contribute majority of the budget for the mission. The third one is a renewal. So, once every interval of time, the missions require a periodic renewal. So, these are the three things which are defined in the UNSC resolution for a peacekeeping mission. Here note that the P5 member countries are USA, Russia, China, UK and France. They have the veto power which means they can influence the missions 
and they can also authorize what missions to be implemented and what should not be. So, if there is a peacekeeping mission that has to be sent to Ukraine, then Russia will use its veto power to abandon the mission. So, this is how the UN Security Council is affecting the peacekeeping mission across the world. Now, what should be done to improve the efficiency of peacekeeping forces? The first one is enforcement of reforms. See, there should be stronger mandates for peacekeeping missions. More missions should operate under chapter 7 and this chapter 7 means the use of force. This chapter 7 under UN Security Council means it allows the UN peacekeeping forces to authorize the military action to maintain or restore the peace. So, the mandate of the peacekeeping mission should follow the chapter 7 and they should use the force wherever necessary to stop both the parties. They should stop both the conflicting parties and restore the peace. So, this is active participation of UN peacekeeping mission. So, there should be a stronger mandate and there should be rapid deployment. See, most of the times the peacekeeping missions arrive at the climax of the conflict. So, they should be implemented a permanent peacekeeping force to enable the quick response to the crisis. For example, in the regions like Middle East and the Eastern Europe and in African countries, there should be a permanent peacekeeping forces in order for the quick response to conflicts or crisis. So, the stronger mandate and rapid deployment are the two important things which should be needed for a fuller efficiency of the peacekeeping forces. The next one is accountability reforms. See, there should be a clear accountability. Most of the times, as I have said earlier, the peacekeeping forces are biased towards the P5 countries. So, the member states which are contributing the troops should be held responsible for the mission failure or misconduct. The peacekeeping mission must prioritize protecting civilians and they should use the forces whenever necessary to destroy the evil forces. So, their ultimate goal is the civilian protection. So, from this we have learnt that there should be clear accountability. The country which is sending the peacekeeping mission should be responsible for any failure in the mission. Then there should be prioritization of civilian production. So, these are the two important things under accountability reforms. The third one is representation reform. Say adding permanent members from regions like Africa, Latin America and Asia can reflect the modern geopolitics. So, there should be reforms in UN Security Council itself because the UN Security Council is affecting the work of UN peacekeeping forces. So, we have to reform the UN Security Council in order to make the UN peacekeeping forces more efficient. There should also be a reform in the veto powers of UN Security Council. So, limiting the P5 veto power can avoid the deadlocks on critical peacekeeping decisions. So, these are the important reforms that can be done to improve the efficiency of peacekeeping missions. Now, what can be the India's role and relevance in UN peacekeeping missions? See, India is the top contributor of UN peacekeeping mission. It has sent over 2,50,000 peacekeepers who are deployed in more than 50 missions across various countries. India also provides the command positions and leadership in peacekeeping missions for women. For example, India has deployed first all-female police unit in Liberia in 2007. So, India is encouraging the female participation in peacekeeping missions worldwide. The next one is advocacy for stronger mandates. India calls for robust mandates and reforms in UN Security Council. India also supports the use of Chapter 7 which makes the use of force against conflicts to avoid failures like Rwandan genocide. India is pushing for UNSC reforms side by side. India demands a permanent seat in UN Security Council based on the size, democratic credentials and long-standing contribution to global peacekeeping. India is also a founding member of G4 nations that is India, Germany, Japan and Brazil and these countries collectively advocate for broader representation in United Nations Security Council. So, India's push for UNSC reforms aligns with the goal of a democratic, representative and more efficient peacekeeping mission. India's peacekeeping efforts also strengthen the soft power diplomacy of India. Especially in the conflict zone like Africa and Middle East, India can use its peacekeeping missions as a source of soft power. India's contribution build goodwill and diplomatic relations with other countries, so it aligns with the broader foreign policy goals of India. With this, let us conclude the discussion. This is a main question regarding this topic. UN peacekeeping operations have been increasingly witnessing failures and criticism. Examine the reason for this and suggest a measure to improve their effectiveness. So, the answer for this question we have discussed in this news article discussion. We can use all the important keywords and points we have just discussed 
to write this answer. First, we have to explain why there is a failure in UN peacekeeping operation recently. We have to quote the recent conflicts and crisis zones and how UN peacekeeping mission failed to act in those conflicts. And we have to examine the reasons for this. What is the reason for this failures? Like we have to mention the challenges. And then we have to suggest the measures to improve their effectiveness. That is the way forward. So, this is how we have to approach this question. With this, let us conclude the discussion. If you like the video, please share it with your friends and don't forget to subscribe to Shankarai's Academy YouTube channel. Thank you for watching.